Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Annie Garner. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of the Library, and we're excited tonight to have you in for our discussion. Uh, this is uh, a partnership with Penn State College of Medicine, Penn State Health, and the Dauphin County Library System, three of my favorite organizations. And I should mention, I also work at Penn State Health. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a, a terrific discussion. I hope you all had a chance to watch Black Men in White Coats. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, film, and uh, we're tonight going to have a terrific discussion and, and uh, meet a lot of great panelists from uh, tonight. We are in a webinar format, and uh, when you have a question or an answer you'd like to share, there at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button that you can type. And also wanted to let you know, we will be recording this session and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel for anyone that couldn't attend tonight. And uh, without further ado, I'm passing the microphone to Sonia Nieves, who's gonna take the next uh, session. Good evening. I would like to thank the Dauphin County Library System for extending the opportunity to partner uh, with them for the film screening and to offer the panel discussion this evening. My name is Sonia Nieves. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the director for K through 12 and undergraduate outreach programs at the Penn State College of Medicine in the Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. On behalf of our organization, I would like to once again welcome you to this opportunity for dialogue and action. By watching the film and joining us for this conversation, you've already heeded the first call to action, um, acknowledging that there is a crisis that requires our attention from the collective community. We need more black male physicians across the country and right here in central Pennsylvania. The film put a spotlight on a problem that has existed for far too long and has had a devastating impact on black and brown communities everywhere. And the solution will require a genuine and long-term commitment to creating change in systems that are mired in staying the same. It will take action from each and every one of us. Over the past several years, the Penn State College of Medicine has been taking a closer look at the ways in which we attract or have difficulty attracting students of color to embark on the journey to becoming physicians, researchers, and other healthcare professionals. The challenges are multi-layered from systemic barriers to inequities in access and geographic location. Several strategies have been underway to affect the change that is called for in the film that you watched this past weekend. And I would like to share some of those things that we are doing here at the Penn State College of Medicine. We know that opportunities for meeting and networking with healthcare professionals from similar backgrounds is critical. You heard Dr. Dale say it, if you can see it, you can be it. As such, we began establishing partnerships with historically black colleges and universities, as well as our local high schools that serve diverse communities to introduce students from underrepresented backgrounds to physicians who look like them. These outreach efforts are designed to spark interest and give participants an opportunity to learn, ask questions and be inspired by people from similar backgrounds who embody the success that they hope to achieve. Through these efforts, we hope to increase the number of applications from minority students, in turn increasing the number of students who are interviewed and accepted into Penn State College of Medicine programs. We are actively increasing financial support available for students who come from underrepresented backgrounds and we took advantage of a very unique opportunity uh, recently in which the Penn State University matched 100% of the dollars raised for educational equity scholarships. This is important because we know that there are many students who may be the first in their family to pursue medical education and may be concerned about the cost. Upon admission to the College of Medicine, students from underrepresented backgrounds have access to a newly established mentoring program designed to increase retention by providing additional support for navigating the unique challenges faced by students of color in the medical school community. 
The College of Medicine also hosts 13 student-led organizations that focus on aspects of diversity and belonging that help create a sense of community and provide means for education and advocacy. Additionally, the curriculum is continuously reviewed to be sure that the content reflects the importance of developing competence in working with diverse populations. Our faculty are tackling important topics such as the impact of race, structural racism on medical outcomes, and they're cultivating inclusive spaces for every student to explore such topics. Efforts are also underway to increase representation at the faculty level. These are just highlights of the comprehensive efforts that are underway at the College of Medicine to increase diversity, all of which are supported by our leadership at the university level, the college level, and at Penn State Health. This evening, we are joined by a number of individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, that are part of the movement here at Penn State College of Medicine. They have made the journey and make time to give back through participation in outreach programs, mentoring, and events like this panel discussion. At this time, they will each take a moment to introduce themselves. And we'll start with Dr. Unduku. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ifi Unduku. Um, I am I, I am a hospital medicine. I'm a hospital medicine physician at Hershey Medical Center. Uh, I uh, went to I, I went to undergraduate in University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I am from Las Vegas. I obtained my medical degree at Penn State. I went back to Las Vegas to get my my MBA, my Master's of Business Administration, and then went then returned returned to Hershey to uh, complete my internal medicine residency. And then I've I've stayed on its faculty for the last four years. Um, so you know I'm glad I'm glad to be here. Glad to be a part of this, this esteemed panel. And I'll, I'll hand it off. Sorry, I handed out the Dr. Davis. Actually, I'm I'm going to hold off and go last. So let's uh, let's do Dr. Clark. Hi, everyone. Kofi Clark is my name. I'm, I'm an immigrant American. I went to med school in the University of Ghana Medical School, where it's a different structure as it is in multiple other countries in the world. So we go to med school at 18. We don't do an undergrad. My graduate work was at the University of Oxford in London, then Imperial College in London. And I came into America, did residency in West Bend Hospital and my fellowship in UPMC in gastroenterology. I also hold a research fellowship certificate from Michigan State University and also certificate from the Harvard School of Public Health for Leadership in Academic Medicine. I joined Penn State Health as a professor of medicine and chief of gastroenterology approximately four and a half years ago and it's been a pleasant experience, met some amazing people in here. My area of interest in gastroenterology includes luminal bowel disease, specifically Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and celiac disease. I also have a great interest in mentoring medical students and learners from all different backgrounds as well. My prior life, I had worked in graduate medical education, which introduced me to a lot of people. Thank you for asking me to be part of this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Let's, uh, let's have our student, Amaris Taylor, introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Morris Taylor. I'm a first year medical student, uh, just joined Penn State um, this past summer, uh, 2020. Uh, home for me is uh, just outside of Buffalo, New York. And I did my undergrad education actually in Pennsylvania here at Messiah College on the other side of Harrisburg. Um, <coughs> My bachelor's degree is in biomedical engineering. Um, and following that, I uh, matriculated into Penn State uh, as a medical student, and I'm planning to uh, specialize in family and community medicine. Dr. Daniels. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Elder Daniels. I'm a family medicine physician who's also fellowship trained in primary care sports medicine. I'm originally from uh, Denver, Colorado. I attended uh, Xavier University of Louisiana for my undergrad institution. I then went to Howard University for my medical uh, education. And afterwards, I ended up getting an MPH from George Washington University, which is also in DC. Um, I became a family medicine resident here at Penn State Hershey. And I've been here since. Um, after residency, I completed my uh, fellowship in sports medicine, and now I'm attending here. I am an assistant professor of family and community medicine, as well as assistant professor 
of orthopedics and rehab here. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dwight Davis. Um, I'm the uh, Senior Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs for the College of Medicine. Uh, I'm a member of our uh, Heart and Vascular Institute, uh, and my primary practice is in heart failure transplant. Uh, I'm from uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, I went to uh, college at North Carolina a and and got my degree in engineering physics. Um, I was fortunate enough to think about medical school during uh, college and had a wonderful mentor that helped me apply um, and kind of pushed me along. I uh, uh, did my uh, medical school training at University of Rochester in New York, um, my internship and residency in internal medicine at uh, Boston City, Boston University Hospital in Boston, and then uh, did my cardiology training uh, back in North Carolina at Duke. Um, I uh, looked around at physicians that would allow me to do heart failure, and this was my first choice. Um, I came here to help uh, start our heart transplant program, and, and I've been here ever since. Um, I want to acknowledge the fact that two of my students that I accepted in the medical school are sitting on this panel, uh, which makes me extremely pleased because that's what we're all about. And uh, look forward to uh, the conversation this afternoon with all of you. And I certainly we hope that uh, you will send us uh, uh, messages uh, uh, that we can answer from, uh, from the, the viewing of the film that you saw. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you to all of you for introducing yourselves. As everyone can see, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom and experience represented on this panel. As we prepare for our discussion, I would like to encourage each of the viewers to get involved in this conversation. You can use your Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for the panelists, and we will be sure to address as many of your questions as possible. I also draw your attention to the chat button on your screen where you can feel free to share thoughts or reactions that you have. Um, before we officially get started, um, Ashley, can we take the quick poll of the audience to see who is here with us this evening? So as you're watching, the poll pops up. Please tell us who is watching in your household, and you can check all that apply. I see the results coming in. We'll take just another minute or so. This is great. All right, Ashley, thank you so much for, for us starting the poll for us. So it looks like we have a number of current physician and healthcare professionals with us. We have some community members. Um, parents and caregivers or support people, um, which is great, as well as some graduate or postgraduate students. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I'll kick it off with um, just what feeling were you left with after you viewed the film? Being that you are a physician in um, the health system, uh, but also a consumer, right? Um, what feeling were you left with uh, after viewing? And maybe we can start with Dr. Davis. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy to take that one. So uh, I, I had, I had um, mixed feelings, quite frankly. Um, the, um, it, was, it was certainly depressing, although I knew the, the, the data and the statistics. It was certainly depressing for me to... Uh, uh, be challenged with the reality of, of the paucity of, uh, of black males in, in medicine. Um, even though I knew uh, the, uh, the statistics for that, um, I also was reminded of, of the pathway that it takes to get from some of the places that our um, uh, potential students come from and the challenges that they face. Uh, but 
But at the other end of the spectrum, I was, uh, I was heartened by the fact that there is a discussion going on in this country at, at many levels uh, that bring me hope uh, that we have the opportunity to, to begin to turn that ship around. It's going to take uh, a village, if you will, uh, and I'll get back to that in some of our comments as we go through the, uh, the program. Uh, so um, uh, a little bit of, a, of, of, of depression to start with, but I left with uh, uh, at the end of the program, except for the crying child, uh, I left uh, at the end of the program with, uh, with a lot of hope. I'd like to follow up with that. Um, I was really deeply saddened by um, the movie, in particular that um, you can see, and it's been known for years that black men are dying. We're dying from stroke, we're dying from heart attacks, we're dying from cancer at a higher rate. And the people who are able to become physicians or who have the potential to become physicians um, are not going into the field. And when I saw Tripp crying um, at the end, I think we all can relate to that in terms of how we have this dream of becoming a physician or becoming someone that's different from what uh, our community expects us to be. And we have to overcome so many negative thoughts or negative people trying to push us down or saying that we can't, can't be that. So um, I'm glad that this movie has shed light upon this, uh, but still I'm deeply saddened by it. So if I could add one line on that as well, I share what Dr. Davis and um, Dr. Daniels have spoken about, but I think it re-emphasized a lot of the information we know already. And then on the flip side, what I began to think of, or, or perhaps the message I left with is, we've been having these discussions for a very long time, and we're still having them in 2021. It's time to start thinking of how do we change the narrative? And how do we move this to the next level that hopefully there's an impact? And a year from now, a couple of years from now, the narrative is not going to be the same, but talk about the significant progress and difference that has been made. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I will echo some, many of the sentiments. I think I went through a whole range of emotions as I was watching the movie. I went from surprise, shock, you know, so at times a little angry, at times, you know, I'm proud of what I was seeing uh, about the fact that the Black Men and White Coats was a movement, right? It was, this, it was this movement that Dr. Dale was trying to get out there. But I also felt empowered, you know, like, like Dr. Clark just said, I felt empowered in the concept and in, in the idea of now I want to do something. I want to act. I want to help. I, then I wondered, then I wondered, okay, am I doing enough? Am I not doing enough? What Am I doing my actions to help circumvent uh, the, the, the problems that, that, have, that were outlined in that movie? Um, am I helping? Am I assisting? Am, am I doing enough in those areas? Um, so I felt motivated. I, I felt a whole range of emotions, but I think towards the end of it, I started feeling, okay, well, now I want to, you know, well, now I want to do, now I want to act. It was more than just the emotional reaction. I felt motivated and reinvigorated to, you know, start doing, start, changing my own behaviors or my own actions and start doing more. Yeah, I agree. I had a range of emotion as well. I'm curious, Morris, would you like to, to weigh in and, and offer some thoughts or feelings that you had after watching it? You're kind of on the, the you know, you're embarking on this journey. Um, did you feel inspired or some other feelings? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not to the finish line yet. And, you know, in a lot of ways, there is no finish line. Um, but I think one thing that the video showed me was um, that I did not make it here on my own. Um, and there, there are people and um, who've advocated for me and have paved the way and have mentored me to allow me to be in this position. And even though I'm not, you know, at the end of the journey, um, it, it kind of convicted me about the things that I can be doing, even though I'm only a medical student. Um, the things that I can be doing to help those that um, will be my pre, uh, will, will, will follow me, those that will come behind me, um, those who are still in high school, those who are still wrestling with decisions about whether they can uh, uh, become doctors and the same questions that I wrestled with um, throughout my journey. Um, so I think if anything, uh, it ended with a, with a sense of conviction that, you know, I can actually start to make a difference from this position that I'm in. 
Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge that we have some questions coming in in the q and I'm really excited about that. So thanks to everyone who submitted questions already. Um, do you think that we oftentimes find ourselves preaching to the choir, so to speak, and not having the conversations with the decision makers, the admissions boards, et cetera? I don't know if Dr. Davis, maybe that falls into <laughs> your realm. I don't want to keep putting sure. you on the spot, but. No, that, that, that's, that's fine, that's fine. So, um, you know, I, I, I was about to make this comment, but, but it's, it's somewhere in the middle of our discussion. Um, and, and let me just uh, go back to one of the comments I made before about the village. So a, a, as I see this, th there's, a, there's a, 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 a long journey from um, from uh, some black male in, in grade school uh, to getting to the front door of a medical school, and 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 so although you know I'm gonna I'm gonna take if, if you will the responsibility for a part of that journey, there's a lot that needs to happen before they show up um, at our front door for medical school, and 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 so. Uh, you know, although I'm not going to mention all of the parts, uh, some of those start with the family. And, and I do realize that for some Black males, uh, that family structure isn't as supportive as it needs to be. The second piece of that for me is, is the community. Uh, and that is, is all of those people that, that are a part of that uh, young child's life or that young boy's life. Uh, coming forward, I, I, you know, I, I grew up in in a in an environment where, you know, no one in my neighborhood uh, graduated from high school, let alone went to college, uh, and and so although you know it was a supportive environment, uh, I I didn't have role models um, in in growing up, and so I couldn't see what 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 it was that I was going to end up doing. Uh, the, the, the next piece of that is, is the supports in all of those educational institutions that I'll, I'll mention junior high school and high school uh, and, and the opportunities for them to in some kind of way get to uh, the best college for support that they can be in. And those people that support them along the way that, that, that remind them about uh, what they can do if they if they put their passion to it, and ultimately some support to get to our front door. And at that point, and maybe even before that, and we, you mentioned some of the programs we're already doing in terms of outreach, we can help. Uh, and we've been very, uh, if you will, upfront and supportive in terms of how we've reached out to communities and 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 local colleges and some of the programs that we have that help support uh, and, and give a face to uh, what can happen if those students continue to, to push themselves forward. And then finally, you know, my admissions committee uh, needs to work and continue to work at, uh, at being uh, uh, holistic in terms of our uh, assessment of applicants and also being aware of our responsibility to uh, graduate uh, students who look like the populations that they're gonna take care of. So, so uh, I, there was a long dissertation on, if you will, the, 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 if you will, the steps to be taken and the village that needs to be in place uh, for this six-year-old kid uh, to get to our front door and get into our medical school and ultimately to come back to that community and to take care of people that uh, that they uh, uh, that they live next to. Is there anyone else that would like to weigh in on you know where the conversations really need to be happening um, as far as making real change in the procedural or process kinds of? Okay. Um, as a Black uh, practicing physician for 23 years, five years here at Penn State Health, one of our viewers, Dr. Henderson, is asking about how important do you 
think it is to have a black physician on the admissions committee? And do you feel it's up to the medical school or the community um, as far as responsibility to increase the enrollment of black physicians? So I guess I'll start with that and I'll start out by saying that we have black physicians on the admissions committee and they play a vital role in uh, the work that we do. Uh, one of the other aspects of admissions uh, from my standpoint is, is what our applicants see when they apply to us. And so uh, I've been working really hard with our um, uh, minority groups here uh, to encourage participation by all of our Black faculty in our admissions process. And we have a, uh, a process in place where uh, we do special, if you will, uh, support things for applicants that we invite for interview. And, and I think it's important that while they're here for their interview, they have an opportunity to see uh, someone who looks like them. So, so we've been working very hard at that. And in point of fact, uh, I've been working very hard at trying to be sure that we have uh, Black physicians uh, who are uh, a part of our evaluation process. So thank you for that question. I'd like to add on that. Um, I think the responsibility falls upon both, and I think it's a circular pattern. So we need to have physicians in that missions committee in addition, we also need to have fish physicians who are in the community showing themselves because you can't be what you can't see. So if we get the physicians who are in medical school, go back to the community and show that, hey, that we can do it. And the community goes along with that, similar to what the film has been showing and trying to do. I think that, that both the responsibility falls upon both groups as well. I think there's also needs to be a discussion within the community. Um, I'm a sports medicine physician. And sports are always pushed and pushed um, in the community that, hey, you could be great at sports, you could be great at basketball. I think also there needs to be a change at that, that necessarily that, yes, they could be great at basketball, but they can use that tool to become a physician as well. They can use that tool as a player uh, to become something great in some other profession. And that not necessarily only to use, um, become a player, um, look at also becoming a coach, look at becoming uh, an owner, um, and not just focusing on just becoming um, a sports um, player there, where there's so many avenues that can go. I think that's uh, what was also mentioned in the movie, and I, I'm a firm believer in sports, but I think as a community, we need to use sports more than just saying that you can become a player. That's a really good point. Oh, go ahead, Morris. Yeah, I was just going to say, as, as an applicant also, I think there's definitely some comfort in knowing that um, you're not only being, you know, you're not, you're not standing in front of a white jury or, you know, something like that. Like, I feel like there's some comfort in knowing that there's people who might um, understand where you're coming from or just understand your plight, understand, you know, the things that matter to you and uh, your community and your, your, your perspective on life. Um, and so I think, you know, what what gets presented at interview days and the type of thing, the people that you see definitely definitely does make a difference uh, to echo uh, Dr. Davis's point. Um, and also kind of along the lines of what uh, Dr. Daniels was saying, and I think it might also speak to one of the questions that was mentioned about uh, how being smart is uh, uncool. Um, so like I had a transition um, maybe around middle, middle school where I started to actually see myself doing well in school. Like I, prior to then I wasn't, you know, any, any exceptional student. It was fine to be average. I love basketball. Um, I continue to play basketball and I actually played basketball in college. Um, so to speak into, the, you know, the, the value of sports, um, I def it's definitely something that was important to me. But I came to realize that um, I could, I could uh, um, strive for excellence in sports and also in, in my studies. And I had, and I think a lot of that was due to the people that were around me. Um, I didn't know any black physicians, um, you know, really prior to becoming a medical student, but um, I think um, the people around me kind of empowered me to believe that I can actually accomplish this. Um, and, you know, as I saw, um, as I saw myself accomplishing things along the way um, in an academic setting, I think that also encouraged me to continue to continue going. Um, and, you know, I'm here now and, you know, I don't think there's anything stopping me from accomplishing uh, the ultimate goal of becoming a physician in the future. 
No, I mean, I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, piggyback off of what Moore was saying. And, um, yeah, I love basketball. I, I, I love I love sports, but I, lo- I watch the NBA probably. There's, there's probably a game one in my house all the time. I love basketball. I love sports. I played the last time I played organized sports was, was, was in high school. And I remember being on the basketball team, and I did get the grades. I got really good grades in um, in high school and in, in, in undergrad. But I remember um, being on the basketball team, and this 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 whole notion and concept of it's not cool to be smart. It was interesting because I remember teammates and my coach at the time, and I was about 16, 17 years old. Uh, I think he, you know, they all got the report just to make sure you're eligible to play, right? And they saw that oh, if he's getting straight A's across all his all his you know. And he's taking AP classes. He's he's doing well. And I remember the coach and my my, my teammates are like, "Oh, Ify, you're you're smart." It, and it was like a, a strange question mark, right? Like that, that was just it didn't fit the norm. And that is, but they, they, I say that to say it was surprising and shocking that you know, they they thought I was just jock or just a jock or didn't have some intelligence to me. But at the same time, I embraced that fact, right? I, I embraced the fact that I could get the grades that I were needed to succeed in life, right? I, I, I embraced the fact that I was intelligent and I could play basketball, right? I could be on the football field and, and, and excel in the classroom. I could do both. I could, I could play all the sports. I could hang with the cool kids. I could be the cool kids while being intelligent. I, I, don't, I never got that satisfaction from other people saying I was intelligent. I was driven by myself to get to know the, to, 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 to do well. I, I was driven to get good grades. I was driven to get A's. I was driven to get into college. I had my own internal motivation that was supported by my family. So I didn't need anyone else's justification or anyone else to say it is cool or it isn't cool. I knew it was cool because it, I, I believed it to be cool. And I think some of that has to be internal. It, there's, there will be pressure. There's always going to be some kind of pressure. But that shouldn't cheat. That shouldn't shape you. Someone else's ex- expectations shouldn't shape you. You should have your own goals, your own expectations, and you should work towards them. So yeah, maybe maybe being smart isn't being cool, or maybe it's the coolest thing because then you can be a doctor later on, right? So that's the mentality. You have to flip it. You have to twist it, and then rely upon yourself. You'll get help. Everyone gets help along the way, but you, you shouldn't let someone thinking you're uncool change or alter what you do if that's something that you want to do. So I think if he summarizes what I was going to say extremely well, the one liner I speak to people about all the time is who gets to decide whether you're cool or uncool? It's you. And no one should have that authority or the, um, should I say the nerve to tell you whether you're cool or uncool. Well, you might not be the best sports person. You might not be the um, sharpest looking um, dresser or anything else. But I think you take it upon yourself to be cool where you decide you're cool, whether people see you that way or not. It's easier to say where we're not in high school and middle school when other people don't get you, um, get you involved in other things. But I really like what Ify says, you decide what's cool and what's not cool in your world. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. Um, clearly mentorship is important. Either you received mentoring and mentioned that or you are a mentor and you enjoy kind of giving back to the next generation. Did you find mentors along the way? Um, and if not, what helped you be able to continue on your path? So let, let, me, let me start out with that one um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here today uh, because of three people in addition to my parents, three people in my life. So, so I, I mentioned that neither of my um, parents uh, finished high school, um, and I, I was uh, an athlete in 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 high school and and junior high school, and and it wasn't uh, the right thing to bring books home to study. Uh, you know, the guys in my neighborhood want to hang out, and and so um, my my first mentor really was my high school science teacher who um, um, kind of took me under his wing and um, kept me during off season um, away from doing bad things. Uh, gave me a job after, after school and, and uh, was the first person that actually talked to me about potentially going to college because nobody on my block went. 
Um, and, and, and he was the person that actually got me into a and t and, and I, I, you know, I, I could do the work, but, but I, I, I didn't know that I could. Uh, so, so he was my first mentor. My second one was uh, my uh, department chair in, um, in college and engineering. And I had a lot of family issues in college and, and had a lot of difficult times. And he was the person that kind of pushed me along and, and, and helped me uh, 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 get, through, get through four tough years, uh, helped find some, some uh, uh, student work to help pay the bills and, and, uh, and push me when, when times were difficult. And he was actually the person that wrote my letter to get me into medical school one of them, uh, but his certainly was his experience with me that I think made the difference. And then my third mentor was, um, was a cardiologist uh, at Rochester who gave me a job uh, during the summers and, and, uh, and, and gave me a place to study. And uh, if you remember my introduction, I'm a cardiologist, right? Uh, so, so that was the, 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 the third person in my life that got me here. Uh, and without those three people, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I certainly wouldn't have gone to college. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have gone to medical school and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be here tonight having this conversation. So um, I, I, you know, mentors for me, at least in my life was, was, uh, was life-saving, quite frankly. Um, and I think all of you who are listening to us tonight if you have the opportunity of finding some young child someplace or some medical student someplace that you can be a part of their life, it is, it is, it is, uh, it is vital and important uh, for their growth and development. So I, I, I just wanted to take that opportunity to tell you my story. For, for me, those three people uh, got me here. I also believe that mentors are very important and I continue to mentor um, I think it's important to also mention that mentors don't necessarily have to look like you. Uh, they could be of different backgrounds. They could be of different ethnicities. And mentors are just individuals who can inspire you, can help you on your way, can help you on your journey. And just doing the small things, um, being there for young individuals, giving encouragement, that is doing mentorship uh, capabilities right there. So, um, don't get just caught in the fact that you only need to be um, a mentor or someone who looks like you or been from your background. You can mentor any type of people. So to follow on what Dr. Daniel said, um, all the mentors I met throughout my career have not looked like me, okay? And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. They all went of their, um, out of their way to support what I wanted to do, encourage me to do what I wanted to do as well. So if I can pay a very small amount of that forward, and it doesn't necessarily have to be towards minority individuals, but everyone who thinks I may be of use to them in one way or the other. The other thing to think about is seeking mentors doesn't mean you are wed to the ideas. You need to be careful not to be doing what they want you to do all the, line, um, all the time. They are meant to guide you and to give you some ideas about the possibilities out there in the realm of um, the whole wide universe. So the fact that you have a mentor who might be a school teacher doesn't mean you should follow them to do that. They just give you the opportunity of what is possible out there if you work hard enough and being exposed to the different things out there as well. Thank you. Um, the movie talked about um, you can't be it if you can't see it. And we've talked about that a few times this evening. And along the same lines with mentorship and the fact that not all mentors look like the person that they are um, mentoring. Um, the question came up as a white physician, you know, it's, it's that person's responsibility to help this, um, you know, the students along as well. How, what would be your recommendation for how this person and everyone who isn't African-American or male uh, physician help? What would be your recommendations? How can people help even if they are not from the same background as the folks that they are mentoring? So I can probably start on that. I gave you my examples that all the mentors I've met don't look like me. And we've still maintained a relationship all through the years as well. 
So for those people who sign on, clearly they have an interest in making sure there's a change in the dynamics or a change in the narrative. I don't think there's a simple pathway or a plan to say to people, this is what you follow to mentor somebody to get them to do that. Lending a simple lending hand. So you see somebody who's struggling in class. You see somebody who has some challenges, starting off by finding out how are you doing? How are things going on with you? What, what kind of difficulties are you having? And pointing them in the right directions. So I think mentorship starts with somebody showing an interest in you and then finding out and getting to know you and finding out the things that motivate you or the things that might be holding you back. So I, I hesitate to say there's a simple formula or something to look out to go ahead and mentor people by reaching out to people, even by saying hello to them every morning, okay? Or some basic things that eventually that some relationship is built between you and them so they feel comfortable asking you about different things as well. Sonia, I'll just make one other point. And I think, I think the relationship is binary, um, meaning from, from my standpoint, um, irrespective of what you look like and whether or not you look like or have the same background as someone else, um, the most important part of the, the mentorship relationship is your desire to be available and to be supportive of the other person. Um, and, and, and to push them along or to be available for whatever it is that they need. And, and so I gave you my three mentors. Uh, none of them uh, look like me, quite frankly. Um, the, the other part of that for the, if you will, the, the, the younger people out there listening to this is, is be proactive. Um, you know, you don't have to wait for someone to come find you if there's someone in your life or someone in your school or a teacher or someone else that, that, that you gravitate to or that you think can be supportive, uh, it, it's, it's okay to approach them and, and to say, you know, I'm in your class and, and, and I think I may wanna uh, go to college or, or whatever it is. Uh, would you mind if, if I occasionally uh, dropped you a note to let you know how I'm doing? Uh, so, uh, you, you know, you don't have to wait for someone to come find you. Look around for people in your life who you think can be supportive and, and it's okay to approach them as well. Um, so so, so it, it really is a two-way street. Um, the mentee has to, has to be a part of that relationship. Um, and sometimes it's okay to, 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 to go find your mentor as you look around at people who uh, you think might be supportive of you. Thank you. And, and when we kind of think of that idea of you can be it if you can see it, um, and, and um, the question that comes up in, in our list here that kind of fits with that, what toll does the minority tax, if you will, take on you as a black male physician and what sense of personal responsibility do you feel to bring more men into the medical community? And, and along with that, do you feel that the need to mentor is greater here at Hershey Medical Center? So I'll, I'll, try, I'll try tackling that question. Um, so for, for, for the, for there, there, there are gonna be many people in the audience who don't understand what that, more, what that term minority tax implies. So that term minority tax implies, uh, for uh, just to simplify it, is that in an academic center, the, the fact that I'm a minority, right? I, I feel an obligation to help other minorities out or help, in a, help a minority cause that may not necessarily be uh, help promote my, my, my career at academic advancement. That is a simplified version of a more com of, a, of, a, of, the, of that term of that of a more complicated concept. Now, so to answer that question, how do, how do, how do I feel about that personally? I don't really know. Um, it's complicated, right? I am I'm interested in helping others out, which is why I'm doing it, right. Um, at the same time, I am also interested in advancing my career. Everyone is. You should be going. You should be going towards a new goal. You should, you, my, at one point, my target was in college. Then it was to get into medical school. Then it, was in, then it was to get a residency program. 
the target keeps changing, right? So now that I'm in my career, yes, my goal should be trying to advance in my career, but how do I do that while helping other people out? So to address this minority tax, uh, what I like to tell people is that you should still do those things if you have a passion for them, right? But try to make them count twice, right? If you're doing activities, if you're doing action, if you're doing research, and if it's an area that you're interested in, well, why not, why, why not make it work for you twice, right? If you're doing research and you're looking at population research, why not look at minority research, right? Not look at disparity research because it's something that you're interested in that you won't lose interest and it can help you advance your career. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's complicated, it's convoluted, and you have to, you do have to think in those, you, you do have to think doubly in that way, but it isn't impossible to do. You just have, it, you just have to be wary of that, wary of that process. Um, and I'm sure there, you know, there are people on this panel who have, who have advanced in their careers and who could, who could give you an example, of, maybe give you a better example, but it, it, is, it is a more complex uh, term. But I don't feel like it's fair to have all the pressure be on one person because they belong to a, to a specific minority group that they have to bring everyone up. No, it, it should, but it should come from a, a, a matter of just your own passion, right? If you have that interest, if you, have, if you are inclined to do that, then you know, why not do it? as opposed to being forced to do something that you weren't interested in to, be, to begin with. So I started off by saying that perhaps this is the time to start thinking of changing the narrative. And again, people use these expressions, minority tax, and defining what is expected of you as an individual. So you out there and you think this is the best way you can help other people come along. That's what you should do. And not because you ignore what your societal expectations are of you, but try not to get ourselves boxed into certain definitions, which makes life even much more challenging for us. Let me give you a practical example. There are probably several people who watch all of us on this panel in here may not be speaking to us or may not be part of this discussion. They may be involved in uh, maybe transport or something else in the hospital. Just by seeing you walking around every day, the way you handle yourself, the kind of work you do, they draw inspiration from that. And that's one big um, thing that you're doing for other people that you may not be aware of. So not necessarily agreeing to serve on every committee or being the person that becomes the individual that everyone tends to because then it begins to take a toll on you as well. But then doing all the right things that everybody else would be doing. You happen to be a, a, you're a physician who happens to be black. So you behave like what you, uh, you want to do for yourself and that alone might be a source of inspiration for other, um, other people. Having said that, because minorities may have um, perhaps some reticence of going to speak to other people who don't look like them, I, I also believe that we should have a very low threshold for looking out for people who may be um, silently or perhaps um, um, given little hints of needing some help and maybe just reaching out to them and directing them in the right direction. So uh, me introducing somebody to Dr. Daniels or to Ify, it doesn't mean I have to do that all myself. Somebody who might be interested in doing the specialties that, that they are in, I may just be the individual to introduce them and vice versa as well. So again, we shouldn't be burdened by these labels which um, some other people will be expecting of us. We have to be the best of who, of who we are and people just observing us will be enough for them to learn from us. So a question was submitted, um, as a black female physician, I was truly shocked about how much I learned from the film. I thought it was pretty in tune with the struggle. Was there anything that any of you found surprising when you watched the movie? So what, so I, I learned a lot actually from this movie, from this film. Uh, many statistics I had, I, I was aware of, um, for example, one of the statistics was one in four, sorry, uh, black men have a one in four chance of, you know, of ending up in jail at some point. I was, I was actually aware of that statistic, but there was, there was another one I found really interesting, and that was the correlation between standardized testing and financial, uh, financial uh, resources. That, that students or, uh, so that students and, you know, individuals who had, who had resources and uh, early in their education had a, did, did statistically better on these standardized tests, which was fascinating to me, but it also made me wonder and contemplate. Uh, and I can only use myself as an example because I, I know my grades growing up and I'm a terrible standardized test taker. Terrible, 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 terrible. 
but I went through uh, high school with straight A's, you know, 4.0 GPA. I went to, through undergraduate, I had one A minus. My GPA was a 3.96, but stare, I did terribly on the SAT. I did terribly, well, I passed the MCAT, but I, I didn't think I did as well as I, I, I expected to. And I don't do well with standardized tests. I, I, it's, a, it's a struggle that I've always had. It makes me wonder, like, what is, what is the correlation there? Is it, do I just don't know how to take tests? And we know over time, we've learned that there are people who are great test takers, great standardized test takers, but not necessarily great at the field that they're working in, right? And I say field because that applies to many other, many other standardized tests. And there's another question in the chat about well, how, how should medical schools be applying, how they're be looking at that information. And I think they are. At least I know at Penn State it is because I, I serve on the admissions, the admissions committee that we look at the holistic person, right? You may be someone like me who's not going to do well on a standardized test, but I, I, might, I might show my worth in other ways. And, it, that's, where, and that's where the work has to go, has to go in into, into finding these students and bringing them into medical schools or bringing them into other health-related health programs that they may not be a good standardized test taker, but they can pass a test. Well, maybe we need to look at the other things that they are good at, or other things that they do well. And I, that was shocking to me when I was when I was watching the movie uh, and I saw that statistic. And you know, it, it, it's it's really interesting because I it felt like it was something very personal because it's something I could I could immediately relate to. I went to an HBCU. I went to two. So I went to Xavier and I went to Howard. And um, when I was a medical student at Howard, um, I learned about the Flexner Report. And uh, Dr. Dale did um, mention uh, about that. And he actually brought up a point to fact check him about this. So I, I looked into it. And actually what was surprising about me, uh, to me about this is that, so prior to the Flexner report in which um, was a report about uh, different medical schools and which ones should be able to progress or which ones need to be closed. There were nine HBCU uh, medical schools at that time. And the Flexner report ended seven of them. So there was only two that was remaining. That was Meharry and Howard. What brought light to that is that the decision a person can make can have the effect for generations. Um, in terms of healthcare, people getting um, the appropriate needs that they have, um, that this happened so long ago, but yet we're still feeling the effects today uh, because of a decision uh, to close down uh, these medical schools is something that we're still fighting for today. Um, and that was like a really eye opener. I knew about the Flex Number Report, but watching this film really brought it more to light how um, a decision like that could be made and still for generations, um, the void is not filled. Thank you for those responses. Um, there are a couple of questions here that pertain to this holistic review process that kind of dovetails with what Dr. Iffy was mentioning. Um, Penn State College of Medicine does utilize a holistic review process and is not 100% driven by an MCAT score. Um, could someone talk a little bit about what that looks like on the uh, admission side of things? So... Do I, do you want to, do you want to talk about, I can talk no, about. No, why, why, I, I'll tell you what, if you want to start and then I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll dovetail. Okay. So, um, so uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, so I serve, I helped, I'm one of many people who serve on the admissions council. So I actually, when I look at the students who, who, who get interviews, right? So I, I get interviewed the students and then I look at the, the I'm on the admissions the council as well. When, the, when I look at those students, I don't, look at their grades anymore. Because I imagine if they got to me, they'd already, they'd already passed the minimum requirements or whatever the grading material is, was being looked at. I start looking at their activities. Why did they choose to get into medicine? What, what was their motivation? What, have they, what behaviors have they done that suggest that they really want to do this? Um, I start looking at what are their activities? What do they do for fun? What are they interested in? What do they want to do? Are they interested in research? Are they interested in being a clinician? Are they interested in sports? Like I am interested in sports. And then I try to, I try to understand how that, make, how that makes them a complete person 
in this field of medicine that they're interested that they're interested in interest, entering into, into. And I look at all of that, trying to get a grasp of, and trying to get a feel for what kind of physician this person may or may not be. You know, you know, and that's what I'm looking when I when I look at these admission councils, right? You know, did 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 a student come from a disadvantaged background and they had to fight and fight and fight and suffer and to, to get to where they are? Were they disadvantaged? Did they overcome something that may have, that may explain why they had a bad semester in grades? It's actually why I don't look at people's grades. I look at trying to understand who the person is, and that factors into my decision making process uh, when I when I you know rank or score someone on on uh, on the you know, application process. So so I'll just follow up with a couple couple comments here. Uh, you know we we we've done holistic review probably for. 11, 12 years, I'm dating myself here a little bit <laughs> uh, because we felt that it's, it's been extremely important. And um, what that means for us is that, is that uh, I'll use the word, we have a balanced view of, of all of the elements of the application. And when I say balanced, I mean that, that we don't pick our medical school class by lining up their MECAT scores and their GPA and where they went to college. Um, our approach is basically to look at um, the experiences that they've had um, that have been formative and how they are able to reflect on those experiences and, and how varied they are. We look at what we call their personal qualities. You know, um, uh, what, what have they done for others in terms of service? Um, what hardships they may have had along the way? Uh, if they've had some struggles, how well they have overcome those struggles. Uh, what kinds of, uh, of, of uh, if you will, support systems they've needed and taken advantage of. Um, how well they look at the world around them and embrace uh, differences. And then ultimately, we also have a thing we call metrics. And, and so at the beginning of the process, we, we look at all of those things and there clearly are applicants who are not quite academically ready yet uh, for lots of reasons. Um, and, and, and so anybody that we pull out of that initial pool, we come back and look for those other things that we think may be representative of them being able to be successful. So when an applicant come and, and we make a decision, we take all of the grades out of the application for the interview. So the interviewer can spend all of their time with the applicant looking at those things that have nothing to do with grades. And that's what they write their valuation on is this person that ultimately goes to the admissions committee to be evaluated. So, so that, that's kind of a short summary that follows up on Ify's comments about our balanced view of the applications that we see for medical school. And I can tell you, you know, this year we got uh, pretty close to 9,000 applications uh, for our medical school. Uh, we interviewed about seven or eight percent of those um, in, in terms of what ultimately gets to our, uh, our uh, that gets to interview and ultimately gets to be evaluated uh, at the admissions committee. So, so I hope I answered that question. Thank you. I, I do believe that both of you gave really helpful information. I know we're coming toward the end of our time. We actually are at seven o'clock, but there's a couple, there are just a couple of questions that I would love to get to. So if, if the number of applicants, or I should say matriculating students um, in our medical school or any other medical school are not going at the trajectory that we would like to see, would you say that it's a matter of not interviewing enough black students or that it's that they're not getting they're getting interviewed but not accepted? What do you think might contribute to that situation? So let, let me let me see if I can understand the question. So so um, uh, are you, uh, is the question about accepted students not doing well or is the question about, about applicants who don't get accepted. 
the question is about um, the number of black students or minority students at a medical school, say ours, may not be at the level that we are looking for. So meaning we want to increase diversity even more. Um, do, is it that we don't have enough minority students interviewing or is it that they are being interviewed and offered but not accepted? What is the, the reason for the discrepancy between where we want our numbers to be and where they actually are? Okay, so, so let, let me try and answer that and, and I hope I'm, I'm getting to the point. So, so uh, there are many medical, if you will, minority applicants that we accept to come to medical school here that, that don't come. Uh, and, and so uh, at the front door, uh, the front door is pretty wide open, quite frankly, uh, but, but you have to remember that, that the final decision on where a student goes is the student's decision, right? And, 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 and so many of those students that we've accepted for reasons that they want to live in a large city, right? They like to live in a community that looks like them, that, that, that's not quite typical of, of, of our medical school. Um, we are increasing scholarship support, but many of the schools that we compete with can give what I'm going to call a full ride. We, we don't have those kinds of scholarships here. And then the last is, you know, we're working at trying to increase our, if you will, minority population in our school. It's not quite where I want it to be in terms of how many staff people we have, how many people we have working at all levels in, in the institution and quite frankly in Penn State Health. So, uh, so there, there are a number of, if you will, it's a multifactorial scenario uh, about about who we accept to come to medical school here and decide that they want to, if you will, uh, uh, be in New York City, quite frankly, and and uh, and live close to a community that 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 they grew up in. Now those things are changing because of all of the work that um, that Sonia has talked about. Uh, we now have early assurance programs with a couple of of uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, many of those early assurance programs are now beginning to look at high schools that serve minority communities. Uh, we clearly this year have interviewed a, a, the largest number of minority applicants since I've been uh, an admissions dean here. So, so we're working hard on our side, but you kind of remember it's a small pool, right? I mean, if you look at the total number and so I heard, heard, uh, read the statistic, there are 570 Black males in, in all of the uh, 50, 150 odd medical schools. Uh, and if you do the math, uh, that comes to not, not a whole lot in each one of them. And if you do the statistics, that's about 2%. So all of us are fighting over, if you will, a very, very small pool, which adds to all of the issues that, that I just talked about before. But quite frankly, you know, we, we have a pretty robust system here that, that at least extends a welcome to the vast majority of applicants who apply to us that, that we believe are, uh, can, be, can, be, uh, can come to our medical school and be successful. Uh, the last point I want to make is uh, some of those students, be they minority or non-minority, may need a little bit more work to be successful. The last thing that ought to happen is for us to accept any student who uh, pays a bill of $100,000 a year or $65,000 a year and gets the second or third year medical school and is not successful. So all of those things become uh, parts of what goes into the equation. I hope I, hope, I, hope I partially answered uh, part of the question that, that was posed. You did. Thank you very much. It, it's clearly a, a um, multi-layered um, solution to this um, crisis that Dr. Dale brought forward in this documentary. Um, I am proud of the efforts that we are uh, that we have underway here at the College of Medicine and at Penn State Health to to do the work to change the face of healthcare, if you will. Um, I just want to offer an opportunity for any parting thoughts. We are already 
six minutes over. I feel like this conversation could go on for another hour. Um, but any parting thoughts that folks would like to share before I wrap up? So why don't I start if it's okay with all the other people on the panel as well? So I think the fact that on a Monday evening, um, late in winter, several people signed up to listen to us have this discussion shows that there's a growing interest to make this something that we can do better about. I think we need to start from small steps and go beyond the discussion of what we are um, having and I've had for several years as well. So what do I mean as a specific example? We need to start changing the narrative that when people are, are in an environment where the black male or minority female or any group that um, doesn't look like us, there's a discussion that may be to their disadvantage. So simple things like, oh, I saw this person. He's a very nice kid. He, he has some good scores, but there's something not right about him. Each of us should be able to start asking those difficult questions and say, what do you mean? What do you mean is not right about? Let's be specific. Let's start looking at everybody with the same set of lenses and give them a chance. And by starting those conversations in an environment where we challenge each other to do better, that's the beginning of the change instead of having these discussions over and over again. Don't get me wrong, the discussions are vital because it brings to light the things that we talk about. What I'm challenging all of us is to start asking ourselves that when we are in an environment where the lights are off and people start making comments or assumptions, are we comfortable enough to start saying to them, hang on a second, John Smith, Jane Doe may not be what you expected, but can you be a little more specific? Okay, and by challenging each other's thinking, hopefully we open a broader discussion and make this better. Thank you. Any other parting thoughts? Go ahead, Dr. Daniels. Um, I would like to mention that there, we have pipelines uh, to help get um, students into medical schools, but there's so many leaks in there. That was mentioned in the film. And I was actually one of the people who um, almost leaked out. Um, I just wanna encourage like the community, the people who are watching, that if there is someone or a young individual who has potential, keep pushing them, keep encouraging them. Um, we saw at the end where Tripp was crying. Um, I was encouraged at that moment because he had someone to talk to, uh, someone to, um, to help encourage him, to let him know that um, he can still do it, you know, and that, if, that there's something wrong with other people and not himself. So I just want to mention that out to the other people there, that there is programs, but there are leakages. So if you can step up and just help encourage uh, the young generation to become professionals, be more, aspirate to do better things and just do not settle uh, for what other people are saying, I think that will go a long way. And uh, I'll, I'll piggyback off, uh, off of Elder's comments by one, agreeing, and then two, I, the goal should always be to support whoever you're trying to support, right? That, so, and by that, I mean, uh, the community should always reach and try to help, how, how about how, how, how they can. You know, even a pat on the back, a good job or an encouraging comment can be the difference, can be the one thing that makes them this, that makes a, a student who may be struggling or, or deciding or shoot or at a fork in the road, choose one that's more advantageous for them. Support however you can, support wherever you can, support whomever you can. It, it, and in continuing to do so, you will affect change. You know, I, I remember all the people who helped me in, 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 uh, in direct ways and indirect ways. There were people who I had probably never met who helped me, who, who, who vouched for me or spoke, for, who, who spoke up for me in ways that I don't, I don't know about. And I think that action of trying to help uh, or trying to help and lift up another person has powerful, powerful downstream effects. And you see it with all the people who are on this panel. None of us got here by ourselves. It's impossible to get to where we where we are by ourselves. The, the, the career just the career does not allow for it. So I encourage that to be done for other people to, to reach out and help those around you. It, it'll make an impact. And even if you even if you're not acutely aware of how that impact will be will be uh, will be received. Thank you very much. 
Um, I would like to thank everyone for participating in this important discussion this evening. A special thank you to each and every panelist for sharing your time, your wisdom, and your stories of success. I want to thank everyone who, who tuned in to learn more about what you can do to be part of the solution. I know there are a lot of questions that we didn't get to answer. I'm hoping that we will be able to send some information via email, um, so stay tuned for that. Our hope in offering this panel discussion was really to inspire young Black men and others from underrepresented backgrounds who may be considering careers in medicine to go for it. Not only is it possible, you've heard the stories of success right here. It's vital that you pursue your dream. Whether that dream leads you to a white coat or another avenue of medicine, diversity in healthcare is vital to closing the gap of disparities in health outcomes. You've seen it now, so you can be it and you can support others who set out on this journey. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening.